Yeah, we will have have this recording, and we will uh we we will we will upload this recording afterwards to the YouTube. We have uh, from India, from um, Finland, Pakistan, and okay. So now I think we are we are ready to to start. I'm going to share my my screen. Okay. So first. And welcome to to our first uh, last night ETL seminar in this new year. And now at uh, at um, at our first first last night ETL now is um, uh, is wanting some new uh, some new people to to join our our committee so that uh, if you have any an interest to help us for the uh, to uh, to do the to do the service for the plus net uh, net committee and to help us to uh, uh, just uh, host all those seminars and workshop and all help us to to manage our mail list social media. If you have any of those uh, those interests, you have. You are very welcome to to join our plus net ECN committee, and uh, we are we are also so and for this uh, uh, for this for this seminar we will have a first half an hour for the for the presentation. It's about the theory uh, about uh, uh, plus uh plus uh, uh plus uh, data PAQC and then we will have some practice at the demo about how we will use this uh, plus uh, letter uh plus data uh PAQC and uh, if you have any question you can just uh, uh put a, put in the chat or you can ask after we finish our our present pre, uh, presentation part, and uh, and also th this uh, uh, after we finish this uh, seminar, our our recording will be uploaded to the to the YouTube and on the on the American Plus uh, uh, as 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 channel. So so now I will ask uh, ask you me. Uh, who is uh, also uh, a part of our plus net uh, ECN as a committee member to just introduce our uh, our speaker today? Hey, why I can't move? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, now I will ask uh, ask you me to yeah uh, to just uh, just introduce our. Speaker, yeah, yeah. It's a big pleasure to introduce Dr. Bulk for this Fluxnet ECN seminar. So, Dr. John Bulk received his bachelor's degree in geological sciences at the Ohio State University and his PhD in hydrology from the University of Nevada, Reno. Dr. Bulk works as a research scientist and software engineer at the Desert Research Institute. He has broad interest in earth sciences, including multi-scale hydrologic processes and modeling, climatology, water resources sustainability, and surface energy balance processes. So today, I'm excited to listen to his seminar on the post-processing of the Flux dataset with the Flux Data QAQC software package. So without further ado, John, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me here. Thank you all for tuning in. It seems like it's a real international audience, which is uh, pretty pretty great. 
And I hope you all can get a lot out of this. All right. So yeah, um, we're gonna talk about the Flux Data QAQC software. Let me hide this down here. And let's get into that. So a quick outline, I'm gonna try to not bore you to death with the uh, the theory behind the software here. Um, we're gonna talk about what was it originally designed for? What exactly is this software? What does it do? And just a little bit on what does it not do? So getting into it, I think it's important to have some context on why this software was developed and that might help you with uh, potential applications of the software. So it was originally designed to um, evaluate the accuracy of remotely sensed ET data from the OpenET platform, which provides spatially mapped ET data, like what is shown here to the public. So to do that, Eddy covariance data was gathered from hundreds of stations, primarily Ameriflux stations across the United States and post-processed using this software into a benchmark ET data set. <clears throat> and we filtered out stations based off of their energy balance closure error, <clears throat> which is something that this software was designed to do and then we use that data to directly compare against the open ET remotely sensed ET data and um, like what's shown here. So we decided to apply an energy balance closure correction approach following the FluxNet approach that's in, uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. And uh, we also compared against the uncorrected ET. So what exactly is this software? Um, it's an open source Python package. It's written in Python 3. Um, it's object oriented. It's got two major objects uh, or classes and then some a few others that help those. Uh, it's version controlled using Git. It's on GitHub. It's on the Python package index. Um, it has its own read the docs online documentation, it has automated tests, and it was written in a way so that uh, it can be extended. Um, new modules may be added in the future. And it's really written in a way for people who have some basic understanding with Python to kind of get a hold of eddy covariance data and do kind of customizable workflows with the data. I'll go back to some of the functionality um, here in a minute. So here's some of the, here's a, sorry, a screenshot of the online tutorial and um, of, of the, the content, the uh, page of the, of the uh, online documentation. And actually there's probably so much more on here than I could cover in an, it would take me more than an hour to just cover all the tutorial uh, information that's online. So it's a pretty good resource. There's also, we're gonna go through some of the Jupyter notebooks today in the, the hands-on portion of the, the seminar. <clears throat> But those uh, those examples are also on GitHub. And also, you know, this project is open for community involvement uh, and improvement. Um, so if you're interested in, in adding to the software, there's ways to do that. So, so going back to now, what does the software do? Um, essentially, it's a for, it, it allows uh, one to build a framework for processing eddy flux data. It provides critical tools uh, that help with that um, in a Python environment. The focus of the software is on assessing um, energy balance closure error and other uncertainties in um, mainly in latent energy flux and calculation of ET. 
subsequent subsequently from latent energy. Um, the input for the software is half hourly or hourly eddy covariance time series data, along with any meteorological data. Uh, this is typically what's found from the high frequency data processing software um, associated with the data loggers like Eddy Pro or Easy Flux. It was written in a way that it, it can read in Ameriflux formatted data, for example, and that data can be in CSV or Excel formats. And it outputs data in CSV format, uh, daily and monthly aggregated data. It also uh, creates interactive graphics in HTML format. Um, and, and this flow chart kind of shows how the, uh, how the code works. So the input data, the input flux data um, is read in with a configuration file, which the user has to write, uh, but it is not too difficult. That tells the code where is the where is the weather data, the flux data at, what what are the names of the variables, and um, we'll go over that a little bit more. And then some automatic conversions occur uh, in the data object, and plots can be created from the initial data or uh, the daily and monthly aggregated data. And uh, that happens with the QA, QC object. Uh, and I'll go a little bit over those in a minute here. So one of the key things that this software can help with is reading in data from uh, in different formats. So it was again developed to create a benchmark ET data set for evaluating um, remotely sensed data. And during that, I was processing uh, hundreds of stations from different networks in different formats. So I tried to make the software somewhat flexible in uh, what kind of data could be read in. So the user in this configuration file can provide um, different information about the the tabular data such as you know what's what format is the date uh the dates uh times listed in or where's the header uh, line in the file you know are there comments above it to skip and um, other information and uh all this happens at that initial step um yeah we can go over the other options uh we'll go over the other options in more detail during the work uh the workshop portion but some of these initial steps include uh, options to um, uh, take averages from multiple sensors um, in the case for example there may be multiple soil heat flux measurements at a station or uh, take weighted averages of those and uh, the software will do automatic unit conversions and other other uh, features that we'll talk about more. Some of the some of the uh, major features of the software include gap filling of data. So this happens in two steps. So the the initial data is gap filled to daily uh, daily average or totals depending on the variable. <clears throat> And there's a lot of control that the user has as far as how long of gaps can be uh, filled um, per day. Uh, different gap lengths can be uh, specified during daytime and nighttime conditions, depending on net radiation. When net radiation is negative is considered nighttime, for example. Uh, the code also has methods built in for automatic data filtering of poor quality data if, if uh, the user provides flags. So for example, FluxNet data provides quality flags with their, with their data 
or thresholds or values uh, from zero to one. Um, and, you know, poor quality data can be removed on the initial read in. The code also has uh, methods to compute a variety of um, weather or meteorological data focused mainly on, on ET. So um, these, these include reference, standardized reference ET from the ASCII formulation, uh, hourly and daily, both uh, fraction of reference ET. Uh, re um, it also downloads gridded reference ET from the GridMet data set. And it can also compute other variables like vapor pressure deficit, vapor pressure, relative humidity, uh, potential clear sky radiation, uh, and some others. Uh, there's also methods in here for gap filling daily ET, because again, it's focused on ET in the end, uh, using reference ET. Um, and I'll show an example of that. It, it, it tracks the number of gaps that have been filled during the gap filling procedures in the major energy balance variables and in ET, both in day sub daily and daily steps for the monthly totals. It computes monthly aggregated data in addition to daily. And it also has multiple methods for energy balance closure corrections, mainly the uh, it's focused on the FlexNet 2015 approach, which is uh, which I'll show in a minute here, but it also includes the regular Bowen ratio approach and a, uh, a method using multiple linear regression. And again, it pr outputs uh, interactive visualizations using HTML files. So this allows um, for visual QA, QC of, of eddy covariance data. And those HTML files are um, have have a few features like panning and zooming. It ties uh, ties the time axis axes of multiple variables together. So, for example, if one was to zoom in on the latent energy uh, plot, it would also to a certain time frame. It would zoom all the other plots of other variables into that same. Uh, period. So we'll see that later. And then finally, it, it can write out the post-process data daily and monthly uh, files using a standard formatting in terms of variable naming schemes um, and uh, date time, uh, date time uh, formatting. Here's an example of the of the daily gap filling for ET, which uses gridded reference ET from GridMet. Something to keep in mind, particularly for those outside of the United States, is this method um, currently would not be supported outside of the United States because the GridMet gridded data set is only covering the uh, contiguous United States. But essentially how this works is um, the code will download reference ET from GridMet over the nearest pixel of the flux station. <clears throat> then it will compute the daily fraction of reference ET, which is the ET divided by uh, the reference ET. And then that ratio is filtered, uh, extreme values are removed. It's smoothed using a seven day moving average and then its gaps are linearly interpolated. And then uh, that time series um, is then multiplied by the gridded reference ET to, to calculate uh, ET for filling in gaps at daily time steps. The plot here is showing that, um, and it, this is something um, that can be useful if gaps are not too long, but here's an example showing how it can also um, one really needs to know your the site to know whether or not it's appropriate to use this approach. So, for example, um, you can see a uh, drops in ET during the growing season. I think this was an alfalfa site where this gap filling approach um, will miss the uh, 
the drops in ET during to due to harvesting. Uh, however, during the peak periods, it seems to, um, or the seasonal trend is captured pretty well, but it's not going to capture something like a, a harvest of a crop. So that's just something to keep in mind. <clears throat> I want to talk just a minute about what energy about the energy balance closure issue with eddy covariance stations is a well known known issue and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how this software. Uh, um, what this software can be used to do regarding that so if you're not aware. Uh, it's a well known issue that with with the eddy covariance systems that. Uh, the measured fluxes of the surface energy balance often do not close. That is, the, the incoming energy often does not equal the outgoing energy <clears throat> as measured at the station. And there's there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, and we can't go in through all of them, but uh, some of the major ones that have been pointed out by others in the past include instrumentation errors and biases, miscalibration, mismatch of footprints between stations, for example, net radiation and soil heat flux being measured at a point versus the turbulent outgoing fluxes of latent and sensible heat are uh, coming off of a of an area off the ground um, upwind of the of the tower. Uh, missed energy sources and sinks um, is a issue. For example, energy can be stored in uh, water uh, on the ground or in the soil or in, in the canopy can be used for uh, used up by plants for photosynthesis. Um, even even in the um, air itself. Uh, high frequency data processing techniques can cause errors in, in different components of the energy balance measurements. Um, <clears throat> how the high frequency data is processed and averaged and corrected. Uh, and lastly, the, the, the atmospheric circulations, uh, violations of the, of the assumptions of the technique. Um, eddies of inappropriate scale, uh, insufficient turbulence, um, atmospheric stability, and other issues. So all these issues um, can resolve in, in energy balance closure error. And it's often that the, the latent energy or the ET and sensible heat typically are underestimated at an eddy covariance station. Uh, compared to the available energy, which is the net radiation minus the soil heat flux. And practitioners tend to apply, will often apply a, um, a correction. Um, it's not always clear what's causing the closure error and exactly the right way to correct it. But oftentimes uh, a correction is applied so this software applies the flux that 2015 or the one flux um, daily energy balance closure correction, which is based off of the Bowen ratio correction, which um, essentially forces the closure. However, the flux net approach takes the average of the um, of the Bowen ratio over moving windows as opposed to forcing closure on any given day. So what you end up with is overall uh, after after correcting the daily latent and sensible heat um, over the long term, the, the, the resulting closure is close to perfect. However, on a given date, um, there's a bit of a dampening of, an, of the effect of the, the closure because it's averaged over uh, 15, 11, or five day moving windows, depending on the daily energy balance ratio that's computed from the data. There's more details about this um, in the software and the paper for this uh, um, 
the software as well as on the on FluxNet's paper and online. And I should say before we get to this, there's also uh, we'll go into them a little bit, but um, there's a high probability that this software will include additional techniques to assess energy balance, closure error, and corrections for it in the future as a part of large analyses that we're doing um, with respect to uh, OpenAT. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the software does not do, where other software might come in, and some key differences with this uh, code and uh, others. So um, the software is not intended for processing of high frequency eddy covariance data. Um, that's typically done by the data logger software. And um, it also does not include anything regarding currently regarding um, carbon dioxide fluxes, uh, such as friction velocity, threshold estimation and filtering or partitioning into uh, uh, ecosystem uh, production or respiration. It doesn't do any partitioning of, of ET into evaporation and transpiration. And it also does not do any automatic spike detection or flagging. <clears throat> and lastly, it does not have a graphic, graphical user interface. It's a Python framework. Uh, one uh, notable difference with the one flux FluxNet approach is that uh, for gap filling, the software currently uses linear interpolation, um, whereas the uh, the one flux or flux net approach uses marginal distribution sampling. And uh, one thing that sets this code apart that from a lot of other similar software out there that I've looked at is that. Uh, it, it's more focused on ET, um, and that, that includes multiple uh, ET-related calculations um, and reference ET calculations. For example, it considers the air temperature effect on latent heat of vaporization, which is used to uh, compute ET from latent energy. Uh, It also has additional, it has multiple energy balance closure corrections and variables that it calculates related to that, um, such as the daily energy balance ratio and others. And I think one thing that sets it apart from a lot of other software, there is, there are, there may be others, but is that the way it integrates uh, any covariance data into Python, um, especially for those who are familiar with some of the useful uh, data analysis uh, packages like pandas and the scientific uh, numerical package numpy and that really helps uh, create customized workflows using this code uh, around eddy covariance data and with that um, i'm happy to take any questions and I don't know if we want to take a little break before we start the workshop uh, portion. Uh, John, yes. Yeah, so I think uh, we can have uh, about uh, about two minutes, two minutes break. Uh, at the at in the in the question, uh, there's one from from Rachel uh, Murphy. So you can see it, John. Can you see the see the question at the T at the I uh, section? Yes. So there is one question from Rachel. Does this tool have the capacity to get filled other fluxes such as CO2, methane, or nitrous oxide? Uh, currently, it does not um, have that functionality it does do some gap it does do gap filling of the four energy balance components and the inputs to reference et so wind speed temperature 
uh, radiation and vapor pressure. Mm. So, so yeah, so it's about, it's, it's mainly focused on that right now, but could be added if there's, especially if there's those who are interested in, in <laughs> some com community uh, involvement. I'm very interested in <laughs> but So there's another question from Risha. Um, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but there was mention of filtering in the processing to improve data quality. Could you extend on this? Was this for smoothing or another type of filtering? Yeah, so there's a, so there's, I think that's re re regarding the, f the filtering steps that are um, uh, that use data quality flags or thresholds. So um, as far as automated filtering goes, that's the main one where it's really not automated. It's more based off of user provided or t tech team, you know, PI provided quality flags um that come with the data uh so for example if there's a uh, threshold uh, a numerical threshold of a system or a flag like a b c uh signifying low quality medium or high quality um, it can automatically apply those to uh, any variables and remove poor quality or others mm -hmm. Yeah, you got a lot of questions, John. Yeah, so another, okay. yeah. So mm -hmm. another question from Fernando: Have you evaluate the accuracy of the failing method that you have in your package? Uh, of the which method? Sorry, I didn't hear it. The accuracy. How accurate is this failing method? Is the filling? A uh, filling method. Gap filling method. Gap filling the method. Gap. Gap filling yeah. method. Mm -hmm. Uh, how accurate is it? So, uh, I mean, have you tested that I, with, you know, like some test, test data set or. Right. Yeah. Um, well, we're, the, the way we do it is, is, um, very conservative. So, um, I've looked, we've looked at it with different gap lengths and to kind of get an idea of what we would trust. So. The data is the, 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 dip, the default, for example, is to only fill up to two hours of gaps during daytime periods in the surface energy balance variables. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, it usually results, it doesn't result in any kind of, um, uh, you know, unexpected or results. So, yeah, we have. So what I mentioned on the first slides of the benchmark data set that was produced using the software, out every one of the so the final data set had around 180, 186 stations in it. Um, 152 have been used so far, but over 350 stations were um, compiled, and we looked at every ones uh, every one of those stations. Uh, at their data visually to, to get a check. And that's one of the main purposes of this code is to look at the data visually. Um, not a lot of automated quality, you know, kind of adjustments are are involved in it, but a lot of, uh, a lot of it's done visually. And then... Um, gotcha. Yeah, John, so I'm that, sorry, but you have like six more questions to go over. Sam, do you how do you want to handle this? Like yeah, I think we can go on and uh, we can add quickly maybe answer it at, at the end. Yeah. 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 So for those who gave another like a very good questions, maybe we will address this after we finish all the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, so uh, are we ready to, do we, 
do we want to take a little break did you say or are we oh uh, maybe yeah. we move on to the okay. real yeah your exercise all right then i'll uh i'll start sharing my screen again <laughs> all right oh uh, or john do you want to take some break or are you okay no no i'm okay i'm okay okay cool All right, so now for the, all right. Oh shoot, let me minimize this. All right, so hopefully everyone was able to install the software, um, download the example files and have Jupyter Notebook installed. I'm gonna go over, uh, go over that, uh, some of the examples that are on the software's uh, uh, page on GitHub and also some extra um, examples that I added for the workshop. And yeah, so, if you're not aware, um, there's, uh, let me just start a Jupyter Notebook first. So I'm having trouble with my browser. So I've been doing this, copy this and put it in to Google Chrome. Hmm. Okay, it's a little slow. All right. So before we get started, I'm gonna open this notebook where I took some notes. So a, uh, if you haven't installed uh, the software online, um, hopefully you've installed. I'm not going to go over the installation of the software right now because I think that would just take up too much time. But uh, one thing I found for if you haven't downloaded the example data, which I'm going to go over now. Um, What you can do is you can go to the page on GitHub that has the example files in it, which I'm going to show here. Yeah. So you can go to this page, you can take, you can copy that link, and then you can go to this download tool. This is how I did it here. And you can type it, you can paste in that link with all the files, all the example files and folders into that link. And then you can hit enter and it will download them. <clears throat> also, I've created a new um, Conda environment for this software uh, workshop to make sure it would work using the current well, work on my system. Hopefully you didn't have any issues. But one thing I noticed is sometimes the within notebook uh, plotting did not work, but that's really not a big deal because, and I'll show that in a minute, that there's other ways to plot the data using the code uh, instead of using the um, notebook option you can hit just write save which i'll show that in a minute but these are just some notes i ran into or some things i ran into and took notes so yeah with that let's just start a uh, tutorial uh, example close this so if you have these examples um I'm going to open this tutorial notebook. These are somewhat similar to what's on the uh, 
online documentation. And I'm also going to open up while that's loading up here. I want to look at, at uh, the main two input files that you need to have to run Flux Data QA QC, which are, of course, a data file with data in it. So let's open one of those first. So this is a Fluxnet daily, or sorry, hourly or half hourly data file for the US-AR1 station. <clears throat> and we can see we open it, we have a timestamp column and we have all the variables uh, names here and uh, yeah, so that's our that's our ID flux data file that's processed to I believe half hourly data. Uh, I mean time steps. Or actually, this is this a this is a daily no. Huh. Okay. And then, all right, so let's see. I think I opened the wrong file that's not used in the, uh, by this tutorial. I think that was a, looked like daily time steps. I think it's this Ameriflux file that's used in the tutorial, yeah. So this is the US-TW3 Twitchell Island flux station and in the Ameriflux format. Right. And we have a uh, 30 minute data here and the header line starts on the fourth row. Okay. And we can see that there's no data value given here, minus 9999, which is the Meriflux format. So now looking at that, I'm going to open up this um, config file for that file. So this is the file. This is the most work um, that one would need to do to use the Flux Data software, Flux, Flux Data QAQC code. Really, um, there's not too much to this. Most of the work needs to be done uh, there's two sections, the metadata section and down here, this data section. So it has to be written like this. And in the data section, you need to define the, a variety of uh, <clears throat> variables. Now there's a list and I'll show you in a minute of variables that the code <clears throat> the code recognizes, you know, variables that it will recognize, for example, latent heat flux, sensible heat flux, net radiation, and uh, soil heat flux. <clears throat> or in the it's called ground heat flux or ground flux. And um, others that are also, it, it, it can utilize like um, average air temperature and uh, wind speed and others. But those four major uh, energy balance components are, are expected uh, to use most of the functionality of the code. Others are required for some ca calculations. So you need to define the names of those columns <clears throat> in the file and the units. All right, and as far as metadata, most of this is all optional metadata. So this file was created using some code I made to just read it from the Amerifluxes um, metadata files, but some of the required metadata is the path, <clears throat> the climate file path, we call it the climate file, it's the, the, the tabular data file uh, path, the latitude and longitude, uh, the elevation, these are used in some of the computations, missing data value, um, 
is required the the date parser string and this is based off of um, a date time in in uh, Python and the site ID is required. All the rest of this is just extra and uh, useful to have if you have it. And you can make any arbitrary other metadata up that you want to put in here just following this format equals the name of the variable then equals. All right. So let's go ahead and look at this uh, tutorial. So here we go. Um, the major <coughs> modules in Flux ADQ AQC again are the data object, which are major classes. I mean, the data object, the QAQC object, and the plot object. They're imported here. The rest are bouquet plotting and pandas for some of the just some of the examples that are done in this uh, notebook. I also added matplotlib just for quick plots. So here we're, we're reading in um, the config file using the data object. So this is the first thing that, that, that you would do in this workflow after the configuration files written correctly. Uh, and there's more details that I couldn't go, I won't be able to go into about how to set up a king config file on the online documentation. But um, so we can run that. Now we've read in a uh, config file. Now we can access some of the um, attributes of the config file. I'll add in some. So for example, if you're, uh, you can do that tab comp complete to see some of the options. So config file uh, path is shown here, it's showing where this file is. Uh, longitude of the station you can get here, that's from the metadata. Um, you can get the header file of the uh, climate file, the, 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 the flux data file. Um, You can you can look at uh, the the units that you need the data to be in. Uh, yeah, you can look at um, so the uh, names of the variables. So. The, the, the sets of uh, <clears throat> variable names that the code recognizes using their def their uh, standardized naming format here on the left and what they're named in your um, configuration file and in your your data file on the right here in this dictionary. It's a Python dictionary. All right, let's go ahead and see what examples are in this. Um, so we can see there's the config file. Now, if you're on a Windows computer, it's gonna it's gonna automatically give you it should give you the backslashes here as opposed to a Linux. Um, so that's where the config file is. That's where the climate data file is. Uh, you could also use the configuration parser module in Python, which is what this code is using, to access the information in the in the config file. So here's all the items of the metadata section that we were looking at. Let's run that. So this could be useful if you want to store additional information about your stations um, and get it access in Python. <clears throat> So from there, you could also then get specific op um, specific uh, lines of that metadata section. So you get the section name is the metadata and the option is the uh, whichever one of these you'd like to see. So here's the site name because that's so Twitchell Alpha. 
not sure why this is written here twice. Oh, it's just optional keywords. You can write it without the, the, the keyword arguments. And uh, you can also, if you're not sure of if that variables in the meta, uh, in the config file, you can give it a fallback value. Um, some of the, uh, some of the metadata that I was mentioning that's required or expected to be in the uh, um, configuration files also at, uh, available um, as data attributes. So you don't need to use the config file to get to it. So those include the site ID, elevation, latitude, longitude, the missing data value or NA val is what it's called here. Uh, we already did the header and this uh, variables. So these are the user name, uh, the, the input data files and the standardized, the, the, sorry, the input variable names and the standardized names in the code. Uh, and then again, here's the units that your data is in. Um, that the, if you just do the uh, units and then allowable units are, are, are shown. So if those units are not in the um, allowable units, let's see here. So you could see that, for example, you could have your latent energy in uh, megajoules per meter squared as opposed to watts per meter squared and the conversions will uh, occur in this step you could have your pressure in different in temperature in different units that needs to be defined in the uh, configuration file but you can see what allowable units are shown here and uh, uh, additional unit conversions can be added um, using you know into the future if, if those if anyone's interested now here this is the first time we're accessing the actual data so again this is just showing the this is accessing the data in the climate file using pandas data frame and um so now now the data has actually been read into memory so that's why it took just a little bit longer um this is assessing the first five entries uh, that are not all null, null data. We can just see that keeps the data file um, as it was. However, a few things were renamed. Um, for example, if your data had the soil heat flux variable name the same as the code uses, it's going to rename it to input G. So the code uses G for soil heat flux. And that was the name of the variable itself in the original file. So it put this uh, prefix input in front of it. So um, to not be confused. Also, it looks like this file had multiple uh, uh, soil moisture measurements and they were listed together in the configuration file. So it took the average of those. So theta mean is the average soil moisture between these two. So that was just that's done automatically um, here we could look at the data frame column names which we were just seeing here and uh, if you remember the standardized variable names you can access using the variables attribute you can use that to get the name if you're familiar with those you use this code a lot it's useful to get the name of the um, uh, variable you're looking for without knowing which one it was if you forgot. <laughs> so here we can get this name of G because that was the one that was unique. It was actually renamed, but if you wanted to know what the name of um, 
the average temperature was in the original file was T sonic for the sonic anemometer. If you want to rename the variables to the standard formatting, you can use this um, inverse mapping of the variable names. So this can be useful. I use this a lot. If you wanted to make a copy of the um, data as a pandas data frame, you could do this d dot access the data frame df, and then you could do this uh, rename columns equals this d dot inverse map, and now you'd have your data. Let's see here. It's a lot of missing data, I think. Okay. So now you'd have your data using the standard formatting names, um, which can be useful when you're processing lots of data uh, from different stations and it gets messed up. You get mixed up, which, you know, you just want to always refer to latent energy as LE, for example. Now you have your data in that format. All right, so let's see. We can kind of skip this. This was just an example of reading the config file in again, doing that, changing the data frame, getting just those, the four energy balance uh, variables that we wanted and saving a table of the uh, summary statistics, I think. Yeah, of those to an HTML file. I mean, this, we can run this. And then, and then, uh, so all the data was loaded in. Here's the half hourly data. Now that HTML table was plotted in here. We can see, um, some of the summary statistics for the energy balance variables in that initial data. One thing we notice here is the data frame is indexed to the date time um, that was found in the uh, with the data, which is useful um, in general for dealing with time series data. <clears throat> And uh, this is this example here is taking in using the data frame, the pandas data frame uh, of the initial data, renaming the data so we can easily get our energy balance variables as we were just looking at. And then it's um, this just shows an example of how useful pandas is for time series data. So for example, we can group those by the um, day of year and then take the average. So this example will save a, uh, um, a day of year average of the four energy balance components. And I, you might notice this plot dot add lines line here. And this is um, part of the, the plotting tools that are included with the Flux Data QAQC code. And they include the bokeh. It, it, so it's based around the bokeh plotting package, which is what creates these uh, interactive plots that we haven't gotten to too much yet. But I just wanted to mention that there's a line plot and a scatter plot, uh, generic line and scatter plot tools built into the code. So it's not just the ones that are automated, but you can use it like this example here uh, to do your own custom plots like this one right here. So one thing that this might help with is, um, for example, um, allowing you to make uh, to, to not have to deal with some of the intricacies of the bokeh package, kind of it's, it just simplifies the line and scatter plots, uh, includes things like this hover tool to show you the variables. Um, yeah. 
So here we see the day of year average. All right. Uh, yeah, I think more of that is mentioned here. One of the one of the cool things about the data object and the QAQC object, which I'll show in a little bit, um, and the way that you assess the data for, uh, using the pandas data frame. So let's say you wanted, um, in this case, you want to modify the air temperature data. And uh, you can do that. You just need to make a copy of the data frame, then modify the, the copy. So in this case, X is a copy of the data frame here. D.DF is the data frame. Then we added five to the temperature column. Then we reassign the data frame like this. Now, now the date, now the sonic temperature column is going to have five added to it. Um, just that easy. You could do the same um, to add an additional variable to your data frame um, or other modifications. All right, lastly, with the data object um, in this example, so it's got automated plotting of the initial input data of the flux data. So um, let's see if this is going to work in the, I, I, I put the output type as notebook. If that doesn't work for you, you can do show, which will open the plot in a new tab. Or you can do the default, which is save, and it'll save the HTML file. Yeah, so it worked. Um, so these are plots of the initial data that's found. These plots are not for just any variable. So there's going to be a plot. It's going to attempt to make a plot for um, for a variety of, of uh, data and some of those that are it's trying to, to do are shown here and if it can't do it it's going to say it can't it's missing the data so there's for example a plot for the short wave and potential uh, radiation uh, a precipitation plot an ET plot fraction of reference ET energy balance ratio energy balance scatter uh, graphs. <clears throat> Looks like it misspelled there, latent energy and um, another uh, evaporation scatter plot in addition to the ones that it was able to compute, which are shown here. So let's see, we can, so what we can do is use the zoom tool to look in a little closer here. All right, so this is again the half hourly data, so it's really messy. So we're gonna zoom in again. All right, let's just zoom in on um, two days maybe here. <clears throat> All right, so we see our net radiation curve. Um, we see our uh, you know, it looks good. And what that did is it made all the other plots zoom to the same time period, which is useful for identifying um, issues with the data. So here we got our radiation components, short wave and long wave incoming and outgoing radiation, um, some temperature data. So, uh, it computed dew point temperature. <clears throat> That's a built-in calculation to the code, even though uh, often will compute vapor pressure deficit um, if you provide vapor pressure and temperature and wind speed. So all, all the all the variables that it was able to um, compute from the input data that are part of the default plots are shown here. Yeah, and there's some example, uh, sorry, there's other options. 
with the plotting tools I can that you can use. Um, for example, you can change the number of columns. You can change the the width and height. Uh, if you don't want the x axes to be mer uh, tied to each other, which I don't know why you would not want them to, but you can turn that off. Um, and you can also add um, metadata, like a title on top of the plot. That's this sup super title here. You can specify where you want the file to be saved. So if you run this and you don't say output type is notebook, and it's going to have two columns, this is going to save it by default. It's just made this folder called output. So we were running this notebook tutorial and made this folder output. And uh, yeah, this is going to open in the wrong browser, but it saved it here. Just gonna, it does take a while sometimes to load these, especially these input data plots because half hourly data is so, so much data. <laughs> Yeah, so it saved it here. And if you don't know where it saved it, it you can see where it saved it with the plot file attribute. You can open that file here. We don't need to do that. All right, so Let's go on to the next major component of the uh, software, which is the QAQC object, which is going to automatically do some tempor temporal aggregation of the input data. So this original data here is in half hourly time steps, we can see from the index. Now, we, if we read in, going back in just two lines of code, read in the data file from the config file, then convert it to a QAQC object, it's going to automatically um, turn that data into daily. Uh, it's going to resample it to daily. So now we'll see that. That's going to take maybe a few seconds longer. Let's see. And you can see these options. It's saying, OK, uh, interpolated gaps and energy balance components up to four hours when Net, rate, net radiation is less than zero in two hours when it's greater than zero. Uh, that Those are the default options. And um, you can also change the number of gap, uh, how many gaps are filled. Oh, I think I'm going to show that here in a second. Now we can see the index of the data frame object on this, the QAQC instance here is, are dates, not half hourly. So now they're, we got daily frequency. And if you're not sure on how it's aggregating each individual variable, you can access these. This um, this is kind of like all the variables that are recognized by the code, and how it's going to aggregate not just the daily but also to monthly later on. So, for example, you know things like ET are going to be at totaled, you know, and things like um, energy or uh, the Bowen ratio are going to be averaged. <clears throat> it does keep, it, the, the code tries to estimate what was the original frequency of the data um, based off of how many, you know, two different ways, so how many data points are there per day. So, so it's 30 minute, the original data was 30 minute um, data and 48 samples per day. That's both saying the same thing, but it's useful to know. And you can use that <clears throat> when, con when creating that initial QAQC instance, you can change how many uh, so this daily fraction is how many how many uh, of the um, 
of the initial data you need before um, how to how to put it it's if you have more than you, you don't want to gap fill any more than that if you have more fret more than missing than 20 out of 24 let's say if it was hourly data even though it's not you can give it this fraction if you had more gaps than that you would this code would just make that whole day a gap for the for the variables that it tries to uh, gap fill which are the energy balance variables and the reference ET input variables like temperature. So, um, yeah. So if you made this fraction um, like a zero here, that would mean, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that, but that would mean you basically uh, calculate daily averages, even if all the days, all the all the uh, data were gaps. So usually you want to be somewhat conservative with this approach. You don't. It's better to just drop the data than to gap fill with lots of gaps. You could also just turn it off if this is confusing. You could just say, "Don't drop gaps." So. Uh, and I, uh, down here is an example of uh, <clears throat> different, just running this with a whole bunch of different um, fractions of how many gaps you want to include and not include in the gap filling, like how, how long of gaps you want to fill, and then make a plot of that. And you can kind of see, and this is just going to show, I think, uh, one variable. This will take a while because it's actually reading in that data five different times or so. And um, OK. All right. So we can see. Um, Let's just zoom into a spot where, gosh, there's too much data here, but you can see, you know, if you'd gap filled this uh, net radiation requiring 100% um, of the data, you're going to see this uh, this color here. You're going to see this and you get over here where we relax that limit. You could gap fill up to here, you know, this, uh, getting some, um, different, different results based on how, how many, uh, gaps you're, you're allowing. So, yeah, um, that's just an example of that. All right, so this example shows a, a couple of variables that are included when you're when this is going on um, on the energy balance components. Um, the four major energy balance components, when they're gap being gap filled, the code will compute how many gaps, how many gaps um, were, that were there for each day. So um, in this case, we're just looking at, so on the days where there were more than four gaps in that radiation, are, um, just using this newly computed column, RN sub day gaps. And there's, again, there's gonna be one for, for LE and for H and for G. <clears throat> and we can see those days. All right, so going on, uh, the QAQC object is the, the part, part of the code that does the energy balance closure correction and assessment and uh, calculations. So if we look at it, this attribute called corrected says false, that that's whether or not one of the closure corrections has been run. 
you can see is ET core, which is corrected ET in the, in the data. No, it's not in the data yet. One little uh, thing is that if you run the month, if you try to ac access monthly data currently, it's going to run the correction. Um, you know, it's going to do a bunch of things. So that's just something to keep in mind. And it's going to run the default correction, which is a FlexNet approach. So I guess we can run that. So just trying to access the monthly d data frame is going to download gridded reference CT. It's going to uh, do the FlexNet 2015 daily correction, gap fill uh, with daily uh, reference CT. <clears throat> And it's going to aggregate data to monthly periods. So now that it was all done, you can accept you can access the monthly data frame now it's saying that the data the correction has been applied. Um, here's just an example showing that um, when you do the monthly, if you want to uh, aggregate the monthly, there um, there are options on how many gaps are filled per month as well. So this is this um, threshold parameter in the monthly resampling tool. So if you uh, if you require ninety percent of the days per each month to be required, you put this threshold to 0 0.9. The, the gaps that are filled in the monthly resampling in this code are filled with the um, average value for that month. <clears throat> and the default, I believe, is either, uh, I think it's 0.9. can see this figure that's produced showing the different options. So if you require 90% of the data, this is air temperature. Um, you can see we have more gaps in the, uh, in the monthly totals for this particular data set. Whereas if we only required 30% of each month's data to be there, uh, then we get, we would end up with uh, a full time, a full monthly time series, it looks like, or something close to it. Generally, you want to be conservative. Usually, uh, for example, we use we required um, no more than five days per uh, month to be gap filled uh, in previous uses of the code. So you can see if the correction has been applied, you can also see which method was used. So EBR is the energy balance ratio approach. There's the Bowen ratio and linear regression approach. Um, the energy <clears throat> energy balance ratio approach, it was the approach that was uh, developed by FlexNet. Um, let's see here. So we can um, not quite sure if we want to run this. Yeah, I'm going to skip the, this and go over that a little bit later. I think we're getting close to time, so I'm going to skip through some of this. <clears throat> Here's an example showing if you read in the QAQC object from the data object, you can look at where it's going to save the data to. If it hasn't saved yet, you can see, okay, um, we haven't written out the, the data files yet. Hasn't been corrected, but if you write the data, it's also going to run the correction and it's going to, um, yes. And now those files will be going to the same location. So output, an output folder from where you're running the uh, configuration file was found. And I'm going to open one of these files so we can take a look.
I just opened the monthly one. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when you save the files with this um, with this code, it, it's going to rename all your data using the standardized formatting options. But there's an option to use your original data uh, file, <clears throat> sorry, variable names as well in the right function. It's going to use a, a, this format for date dates. It's going to include some of the computed variables. So example, flux is the to, uh, flux correct core is the corrected sensible and latent heat fluxes added together. That's that column there. In the monthly, uh, sorry here, let's go here. In this monthly data we can see here's the monthly average energy balance closure correction factor. Um, that was applied, multiplied to, uh, against latent energy and sensible heat. Yeah, so we just see uh, a variety of variables. So here's some more com uh, computed variables. So here's the five day climatology of the energy balance ratio. That's used in the correction approach. Um, grid map precipitation is shown here. Gap filled ET data. Uh, still got the sub day gap columns, but there should also be a number of gaps. ET gaps are for in the monthly uh, file here is the number of daily gaps in ET. Yeah, so that's that's an output file. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I, I think that's good on this uh, tutorial. I, since we're so close to time, I wanna just really quickly, because I, I mentioned there's a few other things and I didn't have time to go over everything, but I want to just show quickly, because this is not documented quite yet online. So there's the multiple linear regression approach to assessing relative uh, under and overestimation in the energy balance components. So this is just using multiple linear regression. It, probably not recommended as a closure correction approach for sensible or latent heat, but it's useful to see the relative, just to see the results. Um, so here's the regression that's applied by default. Uh, net radiations, the trusted uh, dependent variable, and then it fits coefficients to the other, to latent energy, sensible heat and soil heat flux. So you can run that by running correct data and then set the method as Lin regress. Um, and then you can see the results in a table here. By so you can see uh, by default, the intercept will be zero. And then you can see, okay, well, thinks the coefficient for latent energy 1.2 and H is about one, it shows you the root mean squared error and the R squared of the uh, regression. <clears throat> so it basically suggesting that latent energy is more underestimated for this site. This is again, the same site we were looking at. Uh, let's say you wanted to run the regression with RN minus G and available energy as the, um, as the uh, dependent variable here. If you forgot the names of those, you can get them here. Now you're gonna to have to compute Rn minus G added to the data frame, which we showed earlier that that can be done, just reassign the data frame. Then you can run the linear regression with <clears throat> Y equals that name of that column. We just cal calculated Rn minus G. Let's run that here. Now we can look at the results. So we get slightly different results, but pretty similar. So about a, a, uh, 
20 percent in uh underestimation of latent energy and maybe an overestimation of h in this regression that's what it's suggesting um and uh yeah, this was just an example showing the Bowen ratio, which is forces closure. If you run the Bowen ratio approach, you look at your um, data frame for your energy balance ratio. After it's corrected, you're going to find that it's always one because that's how the Bowen ratio works. So the corrected energy uh, energy balance ratio or the ratio of turbulent to, to, uh, fluxes to uh, uh, available energy is going to be forced to be one there. And then lastly, this is also, it was mentioned earlier, <clears throat> the code includes computations of the American Society of Civil Engineers standardized reference ET for alfalfa and um, uh, grass, so short and tall reference crops. Uh, if you use the data object, it's gonna it has the option to do hourly reference ET. If you run that, this data was half hourly, so it can't. It's saying it cannot merge that data back into the data frame because the data frame is not hourly; it's less. So it returns that to you as a panda series, so you can use that as you'd like. Here, just being plotted here. The default is the grass. So that's being computed and plotted. So that's the half, the hourly grass reference ET. If you say tall, and if you don't give it a an anemometer height, it's going to assume two meters. If you say tall, you'll get ETR or alfalfa reference. <clears throat> and then finally, um, same for daily formulation, which is a different formulation. Yeah, in that in that case, it will add it in since the data is already at daily. It's going to add it into your data frame, and it's going to save it with your data if you write the data. So that could be useful. So here's a a plot of the daily grass reference ET, and this is using the station input data to compute that. Uh, one thing real quick here, this is also not documented online, but you may find it useful, is that you can download other data from GridMet using this code. So default downloads ET, reference ET and precept for the plots, but it can also download um, humidity, radiation, wind speed, and min and max temperature. And I'm not going to run this because that will take a while to download. But then you could, for example, compute, uh, do this comparison with GridMet shortwave radiation, potential clear sky using the ASCII formulation, which is part of the, which is computed in the code and also uh, whatever the short, shortwave radiation was at the, in the climate data file. And uh, yeah, I get, I think that's a good spot to, um, Great. Yeah. To, Thank to end it. Much. Thanks, everybody. I hope hope it was useful. Let me see if I can. Hold on. Yeah. Thank you, John. This is very helpful, and there are so many tools that we can use to do the QAQC and screen get fill the data, screen the data. So, thank you very much. Uh, um, we can ask some questions in the chat at the, in the Q and A. Uh, as as quickly we can answer all those questions before we end our our seminar. Yeah, hopefully yeah. we do this quickly. Um, and yeah, John, I think you you got a lot of questions. So some questions are related to your tutorial. Maybe if you could answer it quickly, I think that would yeah. be helpful. Yes. One question was when you, um, oh, so this is from Paul in the chat. Does this tool aggregate half, half hourly to daily by summing or taking the mean? So when you do the um, daily average, do you sum it or how do you, how do you calculate the daily mean? 
yeah um it, it it's gonna it depends on the variable but it it's the mean for most of the variables it's the mean yeah mean yeah sounds good on the next mm. next question is from pamela since the package depends on the map grid data is it is it only possible to correct ec for locations in the us only Oh no, it, it doesn't depend on it. Um, it just, that's just for daily gap filling of ET only. So you just need to um, supply the option daily gap fill false when you do the correction. If you... uh, yeah. Uh, and here it is for only for the USA or for outside. USA also. I've I've used it for FluxNet uh, all over the world. Uh, you just can't use the daily daily mean. gap filling approach with yeah. reference ET currently. Gotcha. Okay. Outside yeah. of Sounds the good. US. Sounds yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, and um, you have four more questions. Hopefully, we just go through this uh quickly. So one thing is from Sandy Pen. So this four question is when you had an introduction of your um you know, this method. So I noticed that in one of the figures, some fluxes are negative. What does this mean and how to explain and use the same? So this is actually going back to your previous slide. Um, I think there were some fluxes were negative. So I think, what does this mean and how to explain and use the same? How to explain uh, yeah, they, they, the fluxes can be negative. Um, for example, at nighttime, you can have condense, you can have do and, uh, you can have uh, heat going into the ground. It just depends on which ones you're talking about. But yeah, yeah. maybe send it, Pen. If you have further question, you can. Yeah, I'd John. be happy to talk about it more. Yeah, I'm not sure which one that was. Yeah. Okay. One another question is Xinhua. Uh, can you can we apply? apply this method to forest canopies or complex terrains? Well, the the, the eddy covariance tower needs to be set up appropriately for different it, complex terrains typically is not a good location for eddy covariance station. Mm. So uh, you probably don't want to trust that data as much. Of course, you can use the code to take a look at the data and see what it looks like. And that's really the one, pretty much the main focus of this. Um, you can take a look at, at the data, but uh, that's more of a question for the site uh, uh, installation and team uh, that's setting up this the site. Sounds good. Um, and then I think you already answered this during your tutorial, but uh, from ASAN, does it also fill the gaps for latent and sensible heat? So, yeah. so for, does it fill the gaps for latent and sensible heat mm -hmm. storage, did you say? Or no, just uh, for all the latent and sensible heat, not heat oh. storage. Oh, sorry. It, it fills gaps for latent and sensible heat, uh, net radiation, soil heat flux, air mm -hmm. temperature, uh, wind speed, short wave radiation, and um, vapor pressure. Sounds good. Yeah. We, yeah so, um, sorry if that's not too clear oh yeah no no worry yeah this this question came out came out after your introduction of you know so i think they got the answer so last question is from bumsock hi i'm currently using ready flock block to post process eddy covariance data that we collected from the field is there any point that this post process method might be collaborated with ready flock is is there any like plans to? I, I I'm not I'm not sure if I, I mean, understand it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here I think it's uh, how to collaborate. Use mm. red block as a plus uh, data key 
in his together to process the data, to process the half hour uh, serious data. I, I think how to collaborate, how to use those two packages together uh, in harmony. I think that's the question. Yeah, um, it's been a while since I looked at our Eddie proc. Um, I think there's some differences in the, the functionality of the two. So they might be useful, especially, of course, if you're familiar with R. But um, if you, I really, I, I don't know if I can, if I know the best ways that you would combine these two together. Um, I, and yeah, not at this point that I, I, I can't give a good answer for that because I have not really used it already. Yeah, I think uh, one is for the R, R programming, and the one is for yeah. the Python programming. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we cannot uh, collaborate quite easily. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's that, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Now we are, and we finish the both presentation and uh, and also also practice. And thanks to thanks to John, uh, John, John for your excellent uh, uh, package and uh, and to show how we we use this powerful uh, and uh, very powerful and useful for package. So now it's time for us to, us to say goodbye, everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, John, for your amazing tutorial much. today. Yeah, and thank yeah, you thank all you for, for hosting. Yeah. Thanks for everybody for coming and participating. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> sure. Okay. I enjoyed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thanks. Me... Bye. Let me end the meeting.